There are seven qualities that the Buddha said make you a true person. The Pali term sapurisa can mean a person of integrity, or just kind of an all-around, well-trained person, a full human being. And most of them deal with things that you have to observe for yourself. There are seven qualities in all. There's having a sense of the Dharma, and then having a sense of meaning. The word atta here can mean the meaning of the words and also the goal to which they're directed. Having a sense of yourself, having a sense of how much is enough, having a sense of the right time and place for things, having a sense of how to approach people of different types, and then having a sense of how to judge people that are worthwhile to hang around with. The one you can actually learn just through words is the first one, having a sense of the Dharma. You read up in the Dharma, you learn what the Buddha has to say. But from that point on, you have to use your powers of observation. These, qual these other qualities you develop partly through living with people who already have those, those qualities. In other words, you observe them, see how they handle different situations. But even then, it comes down to your being observant. As the Buddha said, some people are like the tongue that tastes the soup, and other people like the spoon that sits in the soup. The spoon can sit in there for years and have no idea of what the soup tastes like. It's possible to be around people who have a lot of sensitivity, but you may not be as sensitive as they are, so you miss a lot of things. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha said when he was looking for a student, there were two qualities he was interested in. One was that the person be truthful, and the second is that that person be observant. And this means observant of your own actions, but also observant of the people around you. And these qualities have an application that applies both outside and inside. For example, having a sense of the meaning. Some of this you can pick up by asking other people, what does this passage mean? But other times you have to practice for yourself. When the Buddha says concentration, what is concentration like? It's not just a word, and it's not just in its definition. It's in the actual quality. When he talks about being generous, when he talks about having goodwill, it's not just in the words. You want to see what those words are for, the quality inside your own mind that they're pointing at. And that gives you pointers on where you can develop. Having a sense of yourself means having a sense of where your strengths and weaknesses are. What kind of things you need to work on what strengths you have inside that you can rely on to help you with your weak points. Having have a sense of enough, the Buddha illustrates it with having a sense of what's enough food to eat, but it can also be applied in a lot of other, other ways. How much talking is enough? How much meditating is enough? How much money is enough? How many material objects do you need in order to live a happy life that you can also practice the Dharma in. Basically what this comes down to is having a sense of balance. You have to balance many different needs. So there's the need for your income, but there's also need to have some time. And so you have to look around and look at the things you have, things you own. And at one point does to get enough. And when you have a sense of enough, then you realize that you need less money than you thought you did. That means you can work less and you can actually devote more time to the Dharma. But this is something each of us has to find for him or herself. You have to be observant. Having a sense of the right time and place, when to approach people, when to leave them alone, when you can talk to them, especially about things that are when you're going to be critical. When is the right time? You have to learn how to observe people carefully. Look into their eyes, look into the situation around them, to figure out what indicates whether they're going to be receptive or not, and what kind of words you're going to use that will be, be helpful. Years back I was talking to a therapist 
we got onto this issue of when to be critical with people and the things to look for. Is the person in a good mood? Is the person rested and well-fed? And he said it never occurred him never occurred him to think about those things. Of course, my thought I didn't express it to him was, how can you be a therapist if you're not sensitive to this? And even if you're not a therapist, you have to be sensitive to the people around you, people who have power over you, people you have power over. What's the right time and place to say pleasant things? What's the right time and place to say unpleasant things that will be helpful for the work or helpful for the relationship? You've got to learn how to observe these things for yourself. As for knowing the groups of people, this is just a matter of having had some experience with different types of people in different types of situations. When you're with this group of people, what kind of language do you use? What kind of body language do you use? There are some rules you can read about. Miss Manners has books and books and books on manners. But still, a lot of it has to do with just noticing how people react and how other people around you act. There's a great story from the, the book Ishii, the last, he was the last wild Native American, in other words, the first, last one to be brought into white civilization. The rest of his family, the rest of his tide, tribe had died off, and he thought he was just going to let, let them kill him. He walked onto this ranch, sat down, and thought that they would shoot him and that would be the end of it, but they didn't. They, they actually found an anthropologist who knew his language and talked to him. So, and then when he was done, the anthropologist said, okay, what, what Indian tribe would you like to live with? And, and Ishii said, I'd like to live with you. So the anthropologist brought him back to Berkeley and got him a job. And the anthropologist's wife wrote the book about Ishii, and one of the things she said was that even the, the very first day that they invited Ishii to their house to eat, he had impeccable ta table manners. He didn't do anything until he saw what other people were doing. And after Ishii left, she gave her husband a lecture on his manners, saying, you learn from Ishii. This is the kind of person you want to be. You go into a group of people, you're sensitive to how they do things. How to talk to them, how to act with them. When you look in the Buddha's rules for the monks, there are a lot of rules that have to do with etiquette, little tiny things. But they're there because people often get upset by little tiny things. I mean, there are actually some laws that you can break and people don't get upset. You can drive faster than the speed limit, people don't get too upset. But if you say the wrong thing in the wrong company, that's a problem. So you want to be very careful to be observant of these things. It's part of your training, just being sensitive and being observant. Because that moves into the next one, which is learning how to judge people as to who are the best people to associate with. You want to look for people who have a respect for the drama, people who actually don't just listen to the drama but actually try to understand it. They don't just try to understand it, they try to practice it. And they encourage others to practice as well. Because a lot of your personality, your character is going to be determined by the people you hang around with. You pick up their attitudes, you pick up their ideas. We live in different worlds of what the Buddha calls samadhi, which means agreements, and also means conventions and supposings. In other words, our conventions for how we do things. This group has this convention, that group has this set of conventions, this group has these suppositions about what's important and what's not. And when you hang around people, you begin to pick those things up, and they come into the mind. So you want to have a good sense of who are the people that you will associate with. Of course, there are a lot of people in the world that you're going to have to associate with willy-nilly, but what the Buddha is talking about here are the people you go to for advice, that you, the people you try to emulate. Be very careful in how you choose those people. Be very observant. So the training in the Dharma is not just sitting here with your eyes closed. There are time, most of them you have to have your eyes really wide open. 
to observe what's going on, both inside and out. These same principles apply inside. You're practicing meditation. One, you want to know what the Buddha had to say about what goes on in the mind, what to look out for. And then as you're sitting and practicing, you have to figure out, okay, when this comes up in my mind, how does it get classed in the way the Buddha describes what happens in the mind? Is this something positive or is this something negative? When he's talking about rapture, that word can actually create a lot of false images in our minds. We tend to think of St. Teresa going through ecstasies. In some cases, people do really have very intense rapture. Other times it's just a sense of refreshment. You sit here and every part of the body feels totally satisfied. The energy is just right. And that sense of fullness and just rightness, that also counts as bitti, which is rapture. So you have to learn how to recognize these things. Because it's when you recognize them, then you know what to do with them. The Buddhist instructions always have that dimension. He gives us working hypotheses, and they have the two dimensions. One, they're not just there as theory for us to think about and talk about. They're actually maps to help us know what to do. And on the other hand, they're not just instructions saying, do this, do that. They give us some reasons for why we should do this or do that. When the Buddha is teaching mindfulness, and he has, has dhammas as, a, as one of the foundations or one of the frames of reference. Basically, it's to help us figure out when something comes up in the mind, this is what you do with it. If you recognize that something is a hindrance, okay, those are to be abandoned. If you recognize something is a factor for awakening, that's to be developed. So the, the instructions come with imperatives. Of course, the Buddha is not imposing these imperatives on us. He wasn't posing himself as a god who could say, well, I created you and therefore you have to do what I say. He's a fellow human being, but he's an expert. He says, if you want to put an end to suffering, this is what you have to do. He doesn't force these things on us. But if you decide, okay, I'm suffering enough. Listen to his dharma, try to figure out what it's getting at. That's what the word atta means, what it's getting at, both in the sense of what it means and where it's trying to get you to go. Then your practice is going to be a lot more on course. Then there's having a sense of, sense of yourself. Okay, what are your weaknesses when you sit down to meditate? Where are the places your mind tends to go that it shouldn't go? Are you lacking in mindfulness? Are you lacking in alert alertness? Is the problem with the mind a problem more with the body and the breath? Learn how to read yourself so that you can compensate for your weaknesses and also take advantages of your strengths. Because after all, it's Nobody's going to sit in your mind and tell you what to do. You're basically on a course where it's a lot of self-training. And so if you're going to train yourself, you have to learn how to read yourself. And then those other two qualities come in, having a sense of how much is enough and having a sense of the right time. In other words, right now, how much concentration is enough? How much pressure should you put on your breath? If you don't put any pressure at all, the mind is going to slip away. If you put too much, it gets restrictive. How much desire should you have? Or where, you should, where should you focus it? You don't have enough desire, you sit here and kind of daydream. If you have too much desire that you're not paying attention to what you're doing, that becomes a problem too. So you have to learn how to modulate that. And how do you know? Well, with practice. What's the right time? When you get to the question of having a sense of the time and place, what's the right time to focus more on concentration, what's the right time to figure things out? One good rule of thumb is if you've got a problem that's coming up, you're trying to get the mind in concentration, you say, not now. But if it keeps coming back, you say, well, maybe I do have to deal with this. And you deal with it as best you can, given the level of concentration and discernment you have. 
But if you find that you're just whacking, whacking, whacking away at the problem and nothing cuts through, it's a sign you're not ready for that yet. That's when you need to put up a wall and say, not now. Come on, we'll come back to this later. And you get back to the breath. Yes, for groups of people, well, remember there's that committee in your mind. When greed, aversion, and delusion come in their tender and sweet voices, how do you deal with them? When they come with their harsh voices, they're, they're yelling at you. As the Thai say, when they're squeezing your nerves, what do you do? You have to have techniques for dealing with different groups of defilements. Finally, which voices in your mind should you be listening to right now? You notice as you're sitting here, some of the voices seem like you, some of them seem like other people. Or maybe they have taken on your voice, but they're actually coming from somebody else with who knows what assumptions. How do you learn how to recognize that the assumptions behind some of the things being said in your mind is really not worth following at all? And which ones are more worth listening to? In other words, who are your true friends inside? That's something you've got to learn through using your powers of observation. Sometimes it sounds like that really strict voice in your mind is the Dharma. It actually is trying to push you off the path. It's trying to push you so hard that you can't stay on the path and you're going to leave. That's an especially tricky one. But there's also the voice that says, well, you know, the middle way says don't push things too hard. Watch out for that one, too. Because as John Mahabua says, our defilements have their middle way, too. It's right in the middle of the pillow. What the middle way means is that you approach pain and pleasure in the appropriate way. You put up with some pains because you know that if you give in to other pleasures, the corresponding pleasures, it's going to be bad for the mind. You're looking at pains and pleasures as part of a causal f fabric, and not just whether you like them or not. You say, if I indulge in this pleasure, where does it lead? If I indulge in that pain, where does it lead? Or if I inflict this pain, where does it lead? On my inflict this pain on myself, where does it leave? These are things that you have to learn through practice. It's by finding the middle way that you develop your discernment, by observing all these dimensions. And the Buddha doesn't leave you totally adrift in trying to learn these lessons, but he does point out these are the areas you have to pay attention to, in addition to knowing the Dharma, knowing its meaning. And that's not automatic. I've been reading recently a number of writers who have picked up a little poly, and they claim that they have discovered new meanings in the text that totally overturn what everybody thought the Buddha said. And if you really have to know the text to know that they're squeezing the meaning in a strange way. So it's not automatic that once you read the text you're going to understand them, because sometimes you come to them with who knows what agenda. This is why it's good to have training around somebody who's practiced, somebody who's trained. And then use your powers of observation as to what in you needs to be developed, what needs to be abandoned, what's the right time and place, and how much is enough of a particular practice. How do you deal with the different committee members in your mind, figure out which ones you should associate with and which ones you shouldn't? All this you have to learn by trial and error. You don't want it to be just repeated trial and error. You want to be trial sometimes in success, because you're observant. Remember those two qualities, as I said at the beginning. Remember I said, let someone come who's observant and truthful, no deceiver, and I'll teach that person the Dharma. Well, this is how you teach yourself the Dharma, too, by being observant and truthful and keeping these dimensions or these facets of what it means to be an all-around human being in mind. And 
when you can do that, you can learn how to look after yourself. When they talk about carrying the practice into your life, this is how you do it. It's not just figure out how am I going to meditate all the time. It's learning to look at these dimensions in your life, or look at your life from the perspective of these dimensions. And keep up the determination that you want to be as skillful as possible in all these dimensions as you can. <laughs>